Please welcome to the stage Stephen T. Mnuchin, 77th Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America and founder and managing partner of Liberty Strategic Capital for a conversation with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Good afternoon, everyone. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be here on the stage once again with the 77th Treasury Secretary of the United States, Stephen Mnuchin. Good to see you. Great to be back with you. Mr. Secretary, here we are sitting in Doha. Hours from now, I think it's fair to assume that President Biden and his team and Speaker McCarthy and his team will return to the negotiating table in the hope of hammering out a deal to raise the U.S. debt ceiling and avert a historic default by the Treasury Department soon, as soon as June the 1st. Mr. Secretary, there are plenty of dire warnings about what would happen if the United States defaults, including from your successor, Secretary Yellen. Should we take those warnings at face value? Well, I think you should take the warnings at face value, but let me be clear, I don't think we're going to have a default. And Part of the issue is, and this is the problem with the U.S. system, we have a separate process that approves spending, that approves the, the raise in the debt limit. And we have almost a, an identical situation in reverse now as we had when I was negotiating with Speaker Pelosi. So at the time, uh, the Democrats controlled the House, and, and she was very public and was very clear she wasn't going to raise the debt ceiling without increasing spending. We've now gone through several years, I think it's pretty clear, of excess fiscal response, which led to very high inflation. And the Republicans who, who control the House are now saying they don't, we won't raise the debt ceiling without lowering fiscal spending. So I, I think we'll get a deal. Uh, always comes down to the wire, but I think we'll get a deal. Why, if I may ask, are you so confident the there is a contingent, certainly, among those House Republicans that doesn't want to negotiate. And some kind of compromise that satisfies both sides has to be reached. It seems more difficult now than perhaps ever before. I think it always seems very difficult at the time. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I, when I was doing this, it didn't seem particularly easy. Uh, look, I, I think the good news is that Speaker McCarthy and President Biden are speaking directly, uh, and as I said, I, I think both sides knows there needs to be a bipartisan deal, it will be a compromise, and I think we'll get the debt ceiling raised. So that everyone here understands why you have this degree of confidence, what would happen? Paint a picture for us. What would happen, in your view, if they weren't to reach a deal and there were a default? Well, I actually don't think that's helpful, to be honest with you, because, um, look, obviously, you know, the U.S. dollar is the, recurrency, uh, the currency of the world, and obviously the U.S. debt is the safest place. So it, it, it is the U.S. responsibility to make sure that, that that doesn't occur. Now, I will tell you, when I was Treasury Secretary, we did a bunch of contingency planning, which obviously every Treasury Secretary has to do. I don't think it's productive to go into what ifs because I really don't think we're going to be in that situation. Speaking of contingency planning, there are finance ministers here at this forum. Some of them may in fact be in this very room who themselves have been forced to make contingency plans for their economies because of the chance, however small, that the United States defaults. And you might have spoken to some of them at dinner last night, I might imagine. Um, how much damage is this very public game of chicken over the debt ceiling doing to U.S. credibility in this region and around the world? I think this would be one of these things uh, where, again, if it gets done in time, it won't have done much damage. You'll have part of security markets that were a little out of line for a short period of time. Um, I mean, I I'd obviously encourage both sides to reach a decision quickly. Uh, and, and again, you know, this is changing day to day. You know, it, it, it appeared over the weekend they were very close, then mm -hmm. there was a setback. But uh, again, it's my hope that this doesn't come down to the wire. I think your hope and the hope of just about everyone else, um, there is a lot at stake. You mentioned the importance of the U.S. dollars, the world's reserve currency, the concept of exorbitant privilege that rests almost alone 
with the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, do people at home, which is to say not here, I think there is sufficient understanding and recognition here and in this room of the importance and meaning of exorbitant privilege, do people back home understand how much is at stake and how advantageous these an adverse outcome would be to, for example, um, a country like China? Well, again, let me just say, uh, you know, I, I took the responsibility around the dollar very seriously. It, it, it creates certain advantages and it is certain responsibilities. And uh, again, look, I think the bigger issue is really we do have inflation in the U.S. It has been costly. It's led to, you know, very significant rise in interest rates. That's had an impact on the U.S. We've begun to see a slowdown. I think we'll see more of a slowdown not just on the U.S. economy, but as interest rates go uh, higher around the world. And, you know, as I've said th the last two years, um, I've been worried about inflation. Um, I thought the models on the way up didn't predict it because of the excess stimulus. And there's no question, in COVID, we had to spend a lot of money. And I think had we not done that, we would have had a worldwide depression, not recession. But Clearly, coming out of COVID, there's been, in the U.S., way too much spending, and, and that needs to be right-sized. If the main economic uncertainties a year ago were the trajectory of inflation and, of course, the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, both of which we talked about, um, as you survey the economic landscape today, what strikes you as the biggest unknown, call it the biggest uncertainty? Well, I think, I think the biggest uncertainty, I mean, I think the Fed is either done or close to being done. Uh, I think the uncertainty is how long does it take at this point to slow down the economy. Um, I think the Fed was slow to raise rates. I think they'll be slow to lower rates. I don't think they'll lower rates until they're clear that inflation is under control. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to wait for it to get back to 2 percent, but they have to, it's got to get a lot closer to the target. And my own opinion is that the markets are predicting too soon of a Fed easing. So I, I think the, the, the unpredictability is how long does it take. Mr. Secretary, you know a thing or two about banking. Uh, as Secretary of the Treasury, you were one of the main regulators of the U.S. financial system, and long before you became Secretary during the great financial crisis, you bought a bank out of FDIC receivership. You renamed it, you ran it, and eventually you sold it. Four banks in the United States have failed in the past two and a half months, and several others are still in trouble. Having seen the industry from both perspectives, private and public, what lessons should we draw from those failures and what appears to be the fragility of the fractional reserve model. Well, look, there's no question the U.S. bank failures were a result of, first, management failures, and second, regulator failures. So, you know, uh, although there were liquidity issues, and that's always what drives banks, in, in this case, you had a very big mismatch between assets and liabilities. And when you run a bank, that's kind of banking 101. It's the Asset Liability Committee, known as ALCO. And you constantly look at interest rate risk. Um, it's almost surprising to me that this wasn't picked up quicker. Uh, look, I think fortunately, you know, the, the, the three major banks in the U.S. that failed didn't have a, uh, an ongoing impact in the short term, but I think in the long term they will. And I think one of the issues we need to address is FDIC deposit insurance. I think it's way too low. Uh, I think I've said publicly it should be raised to 25 million. I don't think it should be raised to unlimited, but you have to have deposit insurance so that companies who have operating accounts know that their money's safe. And if we don't do that, we're gonna end up with five or six big banks in the United States and that's not it. So. I'm very concerned about deposits leaving regional banks and mid-sized banks, and uh, I think that will have a big long-term impact on the economy. If your suggestion were to become part of the new regulatory environment, is that enough? Should the government and or the arms of government, such as the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, 
do other things to safeguard the U.S. banking system? I, I think that's enough. I mean, I think, uh, you know, people talk about having to change the, the regulations. I don't think they need to change the regulations. The regulations have been clear. And uh, again, I think the, the two key things in banking are interest rate risk and liquidity risk. Bank failures are supposed to have consequences. That, in theory, is what incentivizes management and regulators to safeguard the system. But I, I do wonder to myself about this. If banks can fail with no losses to depositors, which is what happened in the case of SVB and, and the others, and no real fallout in the economy, haven't we just succeeded in socializing risk, turning the government into the implicit guarantor of the financial system and created a whole new category of moral hazard? Well, what, what I would say is the, the problem we have now is, you know, again, in previous bank failures, you know, there were people who took losses. In, in this case, is the deposits were all guaranteed. The problem now is people don't know if there's another bank failure, whether the deposits will be guaranteed or not. And that's why, in my opinion, we need clarity and that they shouldn't be 100% guaranteed. This, this was a warning, but on the other hand, I just think the deposit insurance is too low. But you've seen a lot of money leave mid-size and regional banks exactly for this reason, because people said, I don't want to take that risk. I'll, I'll move my money to a major bank. Well, one other option is consolidation. America may not need five or six big banks like Canada has, for example. It could have more than five or six, but it could have far fewer than the thousands it has now. Well, we've had a, we've had a lot of consolidation, but you know what, what, what I'm talking about are you know the, the 20 or 30 biggest banks. And, and the answer is, I, I think you need to have an economy the size of the U.S. more than five big banks. Mr. Secretary, the Trump administration in which you serve took a tough position on trade with China, and the Biden administration with broad support in Congress, has arguably taken an even tougher stance. It has broken with decades of precedent and vowed to defend Taiwan. It's also had banned the export of advanced semiconductor technology to China. And I wonder, from your perspective, do you see the United States headed toward, or perhaps already in, something akin to a Cold War with China? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a Cold War, but what, what I would say is, you know, the relationships have deteriorated to the point where it is quite concerning. I, I'm not sure that the Biden administration on what they've done has been that much tougher, but the rhetoric has been much tougher. Um, you know, President Trump was very clear, and, you know, we went back and forth many times in negotiating with China to get a fair trade deal to try to balance uh, a lot of these issues to try to make sure that on the national security front we put protections in place, and, and, and these things have continued. I think the problem is, uh, as the two largest economies in the world, we have to be able to communicate. We may not agree on everything, but we have to find areas that we can agree and work together on, and, and that's beyond just the environment. I'm talking about, you know, fundamental issues. So uh, I, I think it's quite concerning where we are. I, I don't think a full decoupling. You know, the other comment I would just make on China is China's population is going to decrease by a couple hundred million people uh, over the next decade, and India is going to increase. So you're going to see dynamics in the region, and uh, it's going to be very expensive for China as their population ages uh, with the economic factors. Is that to say that they are as incentivized, or perhaps more so? I, I think more so. To achieve something of a rapprochement with the United States. Yeah, and, and again, I would just say there are both economic issues and political issues. Obviously, what's going on with China and Russia as it relates to Ukraine is quite concerning. China recently brokered a historic peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Was that a game changer? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't characterize it as a historic peace agreement. I would characterize it as they've reopened relations. And I, I think, on the one hand, that's good um, that they're talking. On the other hand, I think the issues associated with Iran are the same issues that have been there. The, the, the biggest concern is obviously the nuclear uh, situation. And I, I think it needs to be pretty clear from the entire world that Iran shouldn't have nuclear weapons. 
How do you see China's role in the Middle East evolving both financially, I suppose, and militarily? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it evolving that much uh, in either one of the cases. Again, I think we're a far cry from the Belt and Road days. I think China, you know, is with their crackdown, is, is going to have big economic issues internally. So I see it less of an economic influence. Obviously, they're a big consumer of energy, and, you know, that, that, that has an important relationship in the region. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to end with this. China is clearly seeking more clout in this part of the world and other parts of the world. If the United States hopes to regain its clout in this region and persuade governments here to oppose the Russian occupation of eastern Ukraine, or, for example, to view China's ambitions with skepticism, if not mistrust, what should the Biden administration do? What's the recipe for success here? I mean, I think the recipe for success is, you know, the United States has had very strong relationships in this region for very, very long periods of time and needs to continue to strengthen those relationships. The, the, the U.S. is an important trading partner, important strategic partner, and an important military partner in the region. I'd like to thank you very much for spending thank time you. with us here at the Qatar Economic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Mnuchin. Pleasure.